So moving on to my talk, horse taxidermy and, and taxonomy, to give some basis for a history of what a horse is. So a horse is merely a system that is not actually solving the problem it appears to be solving. And the question I'm interested in is, is a system giving the right answer for the right reasons? So why is this important? Machine learning is being applied in many domains these days. So it's through and through being spoken about in the media. And it's very, interesting, very important to have responsibility and transparency in the usage of data. So healthcare and finance, surveillance, uh, autonomous vehicles and government, when you apply machine learning or formal statistics to these areas, you need to be sure uh, that what you're measuring is the effect that you're interested in. So for instance, why exactly was my loan application rejected? something that happened to me recently. And what could I have done differently such that my loan application would not have been rejected? It apparently uh, changed my nationality was one of the reasons because I've only been established in the UK for a couple of years. So we see in the media discussions of deep learning is creating computer systems that we don't fully understand. And it's not really specific to just deep learning but many other systems from uh, 20 or so years. So this one article appeared just a, a few uh, months ago. It speaks about Das et al, where they're looking at when a deep learning vision recognition, uh, image content analysis system determines something's a bedroom, what is it looking at? Is it looking at the same things that a human is? Is it focusing on the bed and the drapes and the window or something else entirely? So it, one of the good quotes in this article is that good students we, as teachers, require them to show their work. Because then you can see they may not have got the right answer, but they've used the right method. And we want to be able to do the same for our algorithms to see if, if it makes sense how they're getting to the answer. Here's another article. Last month, is an algorithm any less racist than a human? People have this idea, computers, they're numeric, they lack personality, they're external to our human culture, therefore they can be objective. However, any algorithm often uh, does, can and does, simply reproduce the biases inherent in the creator and the data that it's using. And there's a <coughs> very big collection of uh, critical alg algorithm studies on machine learning and data science being applied to a variety of different data sets and finding the biases, uncovering the biases inherent in our society. Also, Algorithm Watch, they have an interesting manifesto for of being active in weeding out improper uses of or poor uses of machine learning when it affects human beings. Tim O'Reilly just a few days ago said the great question of the 21st century is whose black box do you trust? And he said understanding how to evade, evaluate algorithms without knowing the exact uh, rules they follow is a key discipline in today's world. And we're finding more and more work is being developed that is seeking to explain what happens when a system can be easily fooled by Goodfellow, who we'll talk a bit later about adversarial networks, and uh, understanding deep neural networks through visualization. You know, is there a layer that's devoted to ostrich head or a unit to detecting ostrich heads? And a nice work uh, recently, Why Should I Trust You?, where they build easy to understand linear classifiers that approximate the decision boundary of a particular, near a particular instance that you have classified to understand what are the most important properties of that example that lead to the classification. So this also leads to uh, impact in machine learning. Kerry Wagstaff in 2012 gave a nice keynote at ICML about machine learning that matters. And she said, many machine learning problems are phrased in terms of an objective function to be optimized. And it's time for us to ask the question of a larger scope, what is the field's objective function? Do we seek to maximize performance in isolated data sets? Or can we characterize progress in a more meaningful way that measures the concrete impact of machine learning innovations? And she has a, a, a nice uh, wiki here that's recording stories of real impact from machine learning and real challenges, how to complete the circle from a uh, machine learning designer and researcher to a complete system to the application of that system in the domain it's intended for back to improving the system or improving the science. So now we turn to taxonomy. A horse is just a system that's not actually addressing the problem it appears to be solving. And a system is a horse only in relation to a specific problem. 
So a horse for one problem may not be a horse for another problem. For instance, reproduce the ground truth by some XYZ factor versus reproduce the ground truth by any means possible. Those are two different problems. So one can be a horse for the first, but not the second. And really, it's us humans who infer a relationship between a system and a problem. But why a horse? So there's a very nice metaphor, a metaphor that I've been um, emphasizing in my research. Clever Hans was a horse that appeared in the 19th century in Germany, handled by a retired school teacher, Wilhelm von Austin. He brought this horse to a, a uh, he, he proposed that this horse was able to solve many problems requiring abstract thought. So, for instance, you would say, Hans, subtract four from eight, or uh, subtract these two numbers, the larger, the smaller from the larger, and Hans would tap, tap out four, or divide eight by four, and Hans would tap out two. And it, not only was he able to do this for, for uh, von Austin, the handler, but also for people in crowds. Would anyone like to ask Hans a question? I would ask, you know, 124, I put a decimal, uh, after the two, which number is in the tenths place? And he would tap out four. So he seemed to be able to answer questions not on account of cues. However, a experimental psychologist, Oscar Fungst, said, these questions that you're asking, Hans, in these uncontrolled environments are possibly not testing what you think they're testing. Let me conduct controlled experiments where we determine, first of all, whether Hans really does possess arithmetic abilities. And if he doesn't possess arithmetic abilities, how is he appearing to do so? So through a, a series of trials, he played with particular variables, played with the sights of Hans, puts a, a bag over his head and, and verbally asked him questions. Hans was unable to answer questions in that scenario. You can see Funkst here pointing to the board. A second point. He would have two people whisper two different numbers to Hans. Neither one knew what the other had whispered, and Hans was asked to add those numbers. And Hans was not able to answer correctly in that case. So it seemed that something was at play. The uh, questioner needed to know the answer to the question, and Hans relied on his sights to have uh, arithmetic abilities. What actually was the case when folks looked deeper is that humans at that time quite naturally when asking a question of a horse, would bow down to watch the hoof and then raise up when the hoof had reached the correct answer. So Hans was merely looking at this subtle cue to get his carrot. So there are other possible metaphors. Ian Goodfellow et al. described Potemkin villages, this image content analysis system that's able to recognize uh, over a thousand different classes the uh, content of the image with 6% error, error rate. But with the adversarial examples and changing these images just slightly, he was able to fool the system and came to the conclusion that these numbers, these really good figures of merit, were merely an illusion and had no weight behind the, the learning of the concepts. In the book uh, Macloreth, a recent book on statistical rethinking, he talks about golems. This is a myth, a Jewish myth. A golem is a a uh, robot sort of thing made out of earth and fire that has a lot of power but no wisdom. You direct the golem to do what you ask and the golem accomplishes it. And so statistical tools are powerful but lack wisdom. But I'd like to argue that Clever Hans is a very appropriate metaphor here and it also provides a, a methodology for what to do in these cases. So here are some similarities between them. Von Austin believed he had taught Hans the concept of numbers. He had a very strict pedagogical method that he employed with his, his uh, students in the past. Hans was allowed time in the pasture to think and discover concepts on his own. So after a lecture on the number one, two, and three, and the meaning of and, Han was eating grass and able to think about four, five, and six, and so on. And Hans could correctly answer unique questions by many people. In, in machine learning, many sincerely believe they have taught a machine a particular concept because the data set is huge, or the data set is carefully constructed, it has good provenance. The system performs significantly better than random for unique problems, unique observations. I used holdout to test. And machine learning is very well established, theoretically grounded, and successful in many applications. 
Observers of Clever Hans did not think that each question that was being asked actually asked something other than, was, than what they heard. So, how much is 2 plus 3? You thought you were asking Hans, but actually he was, say, he was hearing carrot for tapping your hoof until I raise. Now, many don't think that their data set observations could be encoding something other than what they intend. So there can be many ways to reproduce the ground truth of a data set. And just because a system performance is inconsistent with that expected of a random system does not mean that it's likely to have learned X, Y, Z. And today we'll see several examples of this. So Clever Hans presents a methodology as well. Folks recognize that asking Hans more of the same kinds of questions does not add more evidence to the fact or the claim that he can do mathematics. Instead, what he did was control the experimental conditions such that he could test in a relevant way, does Hans really possess uh, experiment, uh, arithmetic acumen? And if not, how is he able to appear so? And I'll discuss two kinds of experiments that are inspired by Funk's approach that lead to determining system success. Does a system really possess an understanding of the concepts? And is it giving the right answers for the right reasons? And if not, how does it appear to? So is horse appropriate? Some have said that uh, the horse metaphor misunderstands fundamentals of supervised uh, machine learning. That perhaps I'm expecting too much of the machine and of the data sets, or that I'm fighting, building and fighting straw men in my discussion of these problems. So what is supervised machine learning really doing? It's merely estimating the joint probability distribution of a labeled data set. And it's not equipped to tease out causal relationships or judge the relevance of those features to the problem. Yet, we see these kinds of claims all the time. That system ABC performs significantly better than random, and so recognizes QRS. Now, what we find feature XYZ is important for recognizing QRS, that it's relevant. Also, uh, one reason against using horses for this is a X, recent XKCD comic. But I argue that horse is appropriate. The metaphor of Clever Hans combines the system and the researcher. Von Austin claimed remarkable things of his horse, and Funks tested those claims in a properly controlled and relevant ways. And Clever Hans, the story also shows us why bigger data is not necessarily better data. Right? It does not solve the problem that we have. Does he really possess arithmetic acumen? It's not like we tried to find that one question that Hans couldn't answer to provide uh, the evidence against it. He had to control the conditions. And seeking how or why a system behaves the way it does is also addressing the question about generalization, right? If we know how a system is working, then we can infer something about its uh, success in the real world and what, it, what could happen in order for it to fail. So here's an example horse from my domain of machine music listening. We have a music, uh, rhythm, uh, music rhythm recognition system, and it uses an amplitude envelope periodicity over 10 seconds of music. There's a deep neural network that takes that as an input. It outputs a posterior distribution over seven rhythm classes. And in a well-used data set, it's got 91% trained test accuracy. So does the system really know how to identify and discriminate between these seven classes? So these are ballroom rhythms and ballroom music. And more importantly, I'm asking, will the system be useful to someone seeking rhythm information in a music recording? Not whether it can give the correct label, but will it be useful for a person in the real world? So we perform the following experiment. I take the system and I play this music. And the system correctly says it's a rumba. Now I perform an intervention. I don't change the system. I keep it the same. But I submit the, the stimulus to a time dilation intervention. I either slow it down or I speed it up by a certain amount. So here's the output after slowing down. I'm not changing the rhythm properties of this music excerpt. That was a, a very slight change of, I think, uh, half a percent. It's a difference of you know, one beat per minute. If the system goes from rumba to waltz, where rumba is in 4-4 time, common time, and waltz is in an odd meter, something else is going on with this system. 
What we see when we submit the inputs to a variety of scalings, plus and minus, the F scores in each one of the classes quickly decays. So this is at the original testing data set uh, values, and we see that we're able to make them all decrease. It loses its ability to detect Roomba when we submit it to less than 3% of a uh, change. Cha-Cha is gone, even though Cha-Cha was at the above 0.9. Quick Step is gone. We can also make the system perform perfectly in each one of the classes as we change the tempo. So just to hear the, the difference, here's the original. And this is where it cannot detect Cha-Cha anymore. That's sped up. That's slowed down. Extremely sensitive to tempo. Doesn't seem to be sensitive to rhythm at all. So is this system, even though it has 91% train test accuracy, do you think it's going to be useful? So we're going to perform a generation experiment. I have a system here that generates music in the, the, a variety of rhythms. I have the previous rhythm recognition system listening. I have a human listening to the same stimulus. And I want the human to detect when the system is 99.99% confident in its classification, what is XYZ? So let's do that experiment right here. I'm going to play these two examples. And you select uh, cha-cha jive are the top one. It's not being shown for some reason. Which of those rhythms is this example? Cha-cha, jive, quick step, rumba. This is, a, this is a rhythm that the system had 99.99% confidence in, the posterior, of a particular class among the seven. And here's the second one. That's confusion, right? But the system said, first one's a tango, the second one's a waltz. <laughs> Even though that second one is not in 3-4 time. And repeating this, we find the same sort of results. It's not detecting rhythm. So 91% train test accuracy. How? is it still able to produce the ground truth from this data set. When we take a look at the data, a particular characteristic, the tempo, we find tempo of excerpts are highly correlated with the correct label. These, uh, the, the uh, light gray large dots are the test examples, the tempo of the test examples, and the black ones are in the tests the training set. The lines that go vertically are the required tempo changes, time stretching, that's needed to make the system choose a wrong answer for that. And we see a lot of the cha-cha, it's very small changes, makes it confused with tango. So the system is using a cue just like Hans. It was tempo. Tempo is not rhythm. So machines learn the darndest thing, right? We thought we were posing the system this particular problem. We've got the audio signal. We've got some rhythm variable, we've got the label of the rhythm. And we have exogenous variables. And we want the system to go from the audio to this label via the rhythm, detecting the rhythm. But in fact, what the data set has and what the system <coughs> found is it goes through this alternate path. There is a ballroom dance competition uh, organization that sets strict requirements on tempo for excerpts. Because it's a competition, you need to balance uh, the complexity with the challenge. And so that's what you see here. These blue lines are the max and min legal values for that particular dance. If you're doing cha-cha, your excerpt must be in that or you're disqualified. So the competition set rules for tempo. And this is affecting the audio. And the system has learned to go via this competition, these competition rules. So now we turn to taxidermy. Should, when you find a horse, should you mount it on your wall? What should you do upon discovering a horse or a system you're giving the right answers for the wrong reasons? So you've uncovered some valuable information to improve the system, its training, and our data sets. You should publish your findings with reproducible code. 
And I have several examples in my own work for that. Now, a pessimist would call Oscar Funk's work, his excellent book here, which was translated in 1911, it's the ultimate negative result. Right? This man was proposing his horse as a mathematician, and Funk's shows it's not. But actually, his work is one of the most important contributions to modern scientific methodology. And I think we need more of it. Now, what should you do when someone discovers your system to be a horse? Well, this is a touchy subject. So don't take it personally. <laughs> Celebrate, because they've uncovered some useful information to improve it, and training and data set and moving forward. And collaborate to build a better system. So the default position, I say, for any machine learning system is horse until proven otherwise. So don't stop at the cross-validation accuracies and confusions, but work to explain the behavior of the system, what it has actually learned to do. So that is horse. That's an explanation of the, uh, the dates. Clever Hans was revealed to be a horse in 1904, and first year of horse, 2016. A piece of graffiti I found in Paris. It's quite uh, appropriate. Thank you very much.